Vayoryam Ognir. No, 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 no. Don't insert an extra syllable. No, no, no. Gna, you have to say you. Vayoryam Ognir. No, 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 no. Vayoryam mm-hmm. Ognir. Okay, someone else try. You can practice at home. This verse which we've just read is spoken by Arjuna. who is beholding the universal form of this Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> Prior to this, Arjuna presumably had a philosophical understanding that God is everything, Krishna is everything, but here he's practically seeing as the the universal form, it's uh, very difficult for us to imagine, but we can, it's described in there, uh, all the, the demigods are seen there and their powers and the whole universe. So Arjuna is here saying what he already knew to be true, but now he's having a direct and stark and startling visual confirmation of this. <clears throat> Something uh, which I've been questioned several times by members of the public in America is is it, do, do we believe in monotheism? Which means the idea that there's one God, because this has been a a perennial criticism of Hinduism, for want of a better term, by Christians, especially, and Muslims also, but especially uh, Christians took it up to the intellectual level, Muslims not so much on the intellectual level, it was more on the uh, Take it or leave it level. Take the sword or take the take the sword on your head or cutting your neck or take the Quran. That's we didn't get into too much discussion of it all. Uh, but among the uh, many many levels of degradation of of uh, sorry of deprecation it means badly criticizing that the Christians undertook against Hindus is that they are polytheistic in general and pantheistic at best. Polytheistic means the belief in many gods and this is considered to be indicative of a very primitive religion. In fact, we find in the Old Testament that uh, Moses was entreated by God, whose name can't be said, according to them, 
uh, to stop all these Jews worshipping all different gods and they should just worship the one God of Israel. So to worship different gods is considered something very primitive. And archaeological excavations show that this was uh, widespread throughout the world, whatever areas they've dug up. Babylon, Egypt, of course, we know from the Greeks and the Romans, from their literature, and uh, in pre-Christian Europe, in uh, the Americas, polytheism, was worshipping different gods, was pretty much a universal phenomenon. And uh, in Hinduism at the highest level, which some Christians actually appreciated as being a highly intellectual construct, the idea that God, well, in the, in the Vedic term, that is Brahma, the all-pervading principle that underlies everything. And that concept is not only in Vedic culture, in many cultures throughout the world, which we don't, most of them we don't know much about because uh, the Christians, they made a, uh, a mission, and the Christian missionaries their mission was not only to establish what they call Christianity, but also to almost literally stamp out not only pre-Christian modes of worship and belief. Of course, they wouldn't the, the worshippers wouldn't call it belief. For them, it was life. It was. Uh, to, to stamp out any traces of it. There, in the conquering of Europe for, by Christianity, there was, sometimes they'd conquer a people and then, and then they would allow them to live as long as they became Christians. But then if they came back some time later and found they were still worshipping their pre-Christian gods, then they'd just kill them all. They were adamant to stamp out such things. But polytheism and pantheism uh, pretty much widespread all over the world. And we, in the Krishna Conscious Movement, we often say that we are monotheistic. Only one God that fits in with Christianity and Islam and probably Judaism, it must be with Judaism also. Uh, but actually the Vedic culture of, uh, we're using here the western terminologies uh, Bhaktis Dhan Thakur also used to use uh, Sanskritizations of such terms just as Bhavishvaravad polytheism becomes Bhavishvaravad the uh, concept of worshipping many controllers or many gods. <coughs> There's another term, um, panentheism, which means to accept that there are many gods, but one is supreme. So Bhaktisthan Sarasvara Thakur analyzed all these different understandings and probably all of them could be applied to the Vedic culture and to Krishna consciousness also. In Christianity there's this idea that all other gods are false except the God of Israel. But here we see Arjuna, he doesn't say that Vayu, the god Vayu is false, or Yama is false, or Agni is false, or Varuna is false, or the moon god is false. They're, they're real. Uh, here, in this verse, Arjuna doesn't say that they are subordinate to Krishna, but actually in the previous verse, he's indicated that. In the previous verse, Arjuna stated, Tvamadi Deva, 
you are the orig- origin, original God. Purusha Puranas, you are the oldest personality. And everyone knows, who's raised in Vedic culture, that that Vayu, Vayu, Yama, Agni, uh, Varuna, Shashanka, also known as Chandra, Chandrama, Hindu, so many names. These all have their creation, but Krishna here it's stated as Adi Deva Purusha Parana. He's not created. Tvamasya Vishvasya Param Nidhanam. He is the supreme refuge of the whole universe. So here is the supreme personality of Godhead being described in relationship to the universe. The universal form is manifestation of the material within uh, the transcendental personality of Godhead. Vitasi Vedam You are the knowable. So that means that he's also the impersonal Brahman. If you say that there's an underlying principle beyond all the gods, even Krishna, which is what the Mayavadis believe, well, uh, Arjuna doesn't accept that. You are the object of knowledge. In jnana, jnana yoga, the object of knowledge is this supreme, generally conceived of as impersonal, but uh, according to the version of Bhagavad Gita, if we take Bhagavad Gita as it is, then the ultimate knowledge, object of knowledge is Krishna, not something beyond Krishna, because there is nothing beyond Krishna. So all these points are to be understood. So in Vedic culture, as in all cultures which are all over the world, and uh, prior to this uh, ghastly manifestations of of, uh, monotheism, in which they, they think that they have to establish monotheism by destroying... Uh, anything else, their idea that to to accept any other God but the supreme controller, the one God, that is blasphemy. Where the Vedic culture accepts that there is the supreme Lord, and there are various uh, what we call in English demigods. Also, there are many Ishvars, Bahavishvaravad, many. Ishwaras, but Ishvara Parama Krishna. The supreme controller is Krishna. Now, sitting here in India in the 21st century, we may tend to think of demigods in a somewhat theoretical way. Their personality is sitting up in some planet somewhere. Uh, Not that the spaceships will be able to go there. Or even if they go to the moon, they won't see the moon as it really is. Because they didn't get the proper visa to go there. They won't see the moon god. So we tend to think the the, the demigods are in their planets and they're temples of the demigods also. We don't see temples of, they're not very common, temples of Vayu... Yama, Agni, Varuna, Shashanka. We don't see Prajapati. Prajapati here means Brahma. There's only one temple of Brahma. Actually, I think there are two, but there's only one known. Everyone says there's one, but I believe there is more than one. At Pushka, that one is there. In Thailand, there are many. Mostly open air, with a little, with some cover from the heat and the rain, but open air. Because at least in South Thailand, throughout the year, it's it's similar climate to here. Never gets just like here. You have an open air temple. You don't. It doesn't need closing up. It's warm enough throughout the year. <laughs> <coughs> so amazing, the demigods they're out there in their in their planets and. They're in temples and in some subtle form. We hear they're within the body of everyone. But previously, all over the world, and Arjuna here also, 
recognized the presence of the demigods everywhere. So this is a mixture of polytheism and pantheism. <coughs> when we feel the air blowing, or if we just think about it, mostly we don't think about the air, but that is Vayu. The, the substance air is non-different from the personality. The river Yamuna is the person, the Devi, the Goddess, who is the eternal consort of Krishna, who in Krishna's Leela married Krishna. And all the rivers. Ganga is a person, she came from the spiritual world. Patita Pavani to purify the persons of Patita Pavani, she purifies those who have fallen. Patita means that which comes down. And she also comes down for the sake of purification. So the name Patita Pavani can be understood in those two ways. And all the rivers, they're all personalities. Here close by I saw there's one river, Gomuki River. All uh, personalities. And actually, if we just sit by a river, quietly, not in a big city where there's always some sound, but in the country, then we can listen to the sound of the river flowing if there is any sound. And we can appreciate this is, this is not just some water. This is a personality. And especially we can uh, appreciate that with the very great rivers. When we see Ganga flowing, we, we know she's flowing so fast. She is flowing. It's not in, in Sanskrit we don't have that word generally. Well, sa as compared to sa. But uh, that can be applied to... Well, that, that's a point. In, in Sanskrit, then, we don't have the words he and she in particular, but referring to just persons, but to everything. Everything's either male or female. <coughs> so, uh, life is everywhere. The river moves. Why? She's a person. Mostly the rivers are sheep. There's a few male rivers also. But they're mostly female. They're known as the daughters of the mountains and the, the uh, wives of the sea if they're direct tributaries. And just a few rivers there called Nada as compared to Nadi, which is the general term, female term for river. They're persons. The air is a person. Fire, you light a fire. Fire is a person. That means especially in the sacred fire we don't throw garbage. We don't. We shouldn't blow the fire. We want to the, the kitchen, the fire we have to build it up from the embers. We don't blow. Do you still follow that culture here in Tamil Nadu? People don't light fires much. I guess it's everything's electricity though. But you're not supposed to blow and you have you can use a fan. You shouldn't blow because otherwise the spittle from your mouth will come. That's that, that's disrespectful. One shouldn't warm one's feet, put one's feet towards the fire. I don't know if these things are followed, but they used to be followed. Because it's disrespectful to Agni, because the fire is Agni. We don't think like that nowadays. We think we, we, because we're raised, uh, one thing is we're raised in the urban culture, and we're raised with the modern scientific outlook in which we understand that these when people used to think that diseases were caused because for, because we'd done some sinful activity, uh, we have to propitiate the gods. So now we know that, well, you just take some medicine and then you get better. Hopefully. Of course, medicine was there in ancient cultures also. <coughs> we know that air is some molecule, approximately... 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 
and some trace chemicals, if it's not polluted, and if it's dry, if there's no humidity in it. So we, we chemically analyze it, and everything is just chemical. If you can study chemistry, then you know everything, because everything's chemicals. Well, you may have to study physics also, because there, there are energies also. So that's the idea. We can analyze everything empirically, by observation. And in this way, we uh, depersonalize everything. Personality is everywhere. Another example, we think, well, the hills and the mountains are there. They say that the Himalayas, they're the world's youngest mountain range. They came up recently in terms of geological time due to this mountains, they say, are caused by different movements of tectonic plates, of massive areas of earth and they move and then they squash something together, liquid stone or something like that, which sets quickly. I don't know exactly how they explain it. But, and then you get mountains. And the Himalayas are recent, according to them. Of course, we don't have to believe them, but we generally do. And that's why we don't appreciate as primitive, so-called primitive people used to, that life is the active principle of everything. Everything moves because of life. Mm. It's, nothing moves without life. The jagat means yogachati iti jagat. That which moves is the world. And how does it move? Aparaya mitasthanyang prakritim vidhime param jiva bhutang mahabaho yayedam dharyate jagat. Dharyate. The world is held in place, or it's held together, kept together by the jiva bhuta, by all the living beings who are an energy which is superior to gross matter. So, the world keeps on going because, one reason is because of the desire of the jivas to enjoy this world, and also literally, where there is movement, there is a personality behind it. Even to open and close our eyes, there is some demigod overseeing that. It's the, the, the scientific idea is atheistic, that everything is just everything has just come this is called science, brilliant theory, which is called science, is that once upon a time, well, there was no time, and all of a sudden, there was an explosion. There was nothing, which mean, there was no matter, which means there was no time either. And then, it, then nothing exploded, and then everything fell into place absolutely perfectly, and here we are all today, and that's a brilliant explanation of why there's no need to believe in any god. You can get a PhD on that. You just have to add a few words which no one can understand and uh, you'll get maybe even a Nobel Prize. Of course, you'd have to say it in a novel way because it's already been said many times. So, we can analyze. Okay, dry water, sorry, dry air without any pollutants in it, if you can find any such stuff anywhere in the world today. Even if you go out into the oceans, the air will be polluted. If not by particles of matter, by radioactivity. <coughs> <coughs> but probably everywhere you'll find some particle pollutants. Uh, you can analyze it one way, 78% nitrogen, 21% approximately oxygen, and so on. That's one way of looking at it. We don't deny that. But the more holistic way of looking at it is seeing that this is, it's not just coming into being 
without any controller. This is what the demons say. Satyam apatishchante jagadahur and ishvara aparaspara sambhutam kimanyat kamahintukam. They say that there's no ultimate principle. There's no, uh, there's no ultimate truth. There's no controller in the world. Everything comes into being simply by chance, practically we can say. Aparaspara. There's no, there's no, uh, mutual relationship between anything. Anything, mutual relationship, of course science means studying mutual relationships between everything. But, <coughs> they say, well it's all just happened like that. There's, it's not by design. Uh, and some of them, if they get a little philosophical in the midst of all this, they think that, well, if there is any cause of anything, then it's desire. Desire is all there is. Now, this uh, atheistic outlook that we imbibe with science, so-called science of the modern age, that is undoubtedly the... the to analyze the chemical components of air or water, unless water in the natural state does not exist as pure dihydrogen oxide, there's always something, some admixture therein, so we can analyze that. <coughs> uh, but that does not mean that it's all simply existing without any controller. There are many controllers. There are many demigods at many levels. The names of the big shot demigods, some of them have been mentioned in this verse. Vayu, uh, Yama. Srila Prabhupada translates Yama as the controller herein. Uh, Agni, fire. Mm. Varuna. Water. <coughs> Shashanka, the moon. Brahma. Uh, so these are seen everywhere. We, we see the effect of the air. We feel now there may be some slight wind blowing. It's quite pleasant. The, the cool air is very pleasant in the evening after a hot day. The violent wind the different manifestations of air. Sometimes the air is completely still on a hot day. Completely still. And we're suffering in the heat. But we know if it's very hot and the air is very still, that's often followed, at least in Bengal, by a tremendous storm after, after that. It can't be hot and still for too long. <coughs> and in and Yama, we see, when we see death, Someone has died. Death has come. Death is a personality. Death has come to take away the soul from the body. So in this culture, and again, it's not simply the Vedic culture in India, but spread throughout the world, maybe with different names and somewhat different concepts, but the, the basic understanding is the same. That Everything in what we call nature, it's not operating simply according to what we would call scientific laws, but there are controllers of everything. There's a reason for everything. If we are sick, there's a reason for that. It's not just because some virus... Got, got in, got past my immune system and infected me. There's, <coughs> there's some other reason. It's because of some sinful activity, uh, I'm getting the result. Or if we see Vaishnavas, then Jato Deko Vaishnava Bebaha Duk Nishchoi Janeho Taha Parananda Shuk. In the case of Vaishnavas, we should not think that they are suffering from any disease or anything else. We should know that they are always in the transcendental position. And the apparent sickness or whatever of devotees is not impelled by sinful reactions per se. Because 
Mahatmanastu Mang Parata Daiving Prakriti Mahashritaha Bhajantya Nanya Manaso Gyatna Bhuta Dilavya Yam Those who worship Krishna with Ananya Manas without their mind deviating from this at all were fully absorbed in serving Krishna knowing him to be uh, the origin of everything and inexhaustible such persons are under the protection of the internal potency of Krishna. So they don't suffer sinful reactions per se, although they may appear to do so. The Vishwarup is a manifestation not of Krishna's internal potency. It's a manifestation of how Krishna is the external potency. He is in one sense non-different from him. The demigods are in one sense non-different from him. So this is a uh, spiritual way, a beginning to the beginning spiritual understanding. To see life in nature that everything in this world there is life and there are power there are spirits if you if you go in the woods you can you can appreciate the, all the trees and all the, uh, the spirits and the whole forest there is one spirit of the whole forest and there may be uh, every every way we can feel that life it's not just some chemicals but uh, there are living beings, full of living beings. The forest is not uh, dull, dry and empty, as we're used to that in the cities. There's, uh, everything is covered with concrete and we don't appreciate uh, life. Uh, we, we, this materialistic outlook that everything is just matter. So then we can just kill the animal because it's just some other chemicals. Uh, so this uh, understanding that life is everywhere. The, the demigods are overseeing everything and Krishna is overseeing the demigods who are in one sense non-different from him. In the sense that uh, they represent him they act on his orders. Even the sun, yes, Yagyaya, Brahmati, Samrita, Kala Chakra. Even the mighty sun, who is the eye of the universe. Yes, Chakshuresha Savita Sakala Grahanam, the Raja Samasta Suramurti Rashesha Teja. The, the incredible sun is giving out such amounts of heat and light at every millisecond and doesn't become exhausted. Even the mighty sun works under Krishna's order. And people in a lower stage of consciousness, they worship such beings. They worship. They may worship some stone, is the kind of thing that the Christians coming to India would laugh at and, and say this is very primitive but the people would re people that's one level of God consciousness to recognize there is some power here <clears throat> there's some some being here <coughs> so there are various levels of worship the yajante sattvika deva persons in the mode of goodness they worship the uh, Demigods, rag, what is it? Uh, raksha, Raksha, Yakshansi, Rajasam, Yaksha, Rakshansi, Rajasam, present in the mode of passion. They worship the Raksha, Rakshasas and Yakshas and, what is that? Bhuta, Pratadi, I can't remember exactly, but in Pratan, Bhutadi, Tamasi, something like this. Those in the mode of ignorance, they worship the ghosts and spirits, but they worship their living beings. They're worshipping a the different understanding. They're living beings. Here. And uh, they can be worshipped, but to come to a higher level, we should understand 
that all the different spirits and powers put together, namate jongsha sambhavam, they all come into being simply from a tiny particle of Krishna's energy. People are very impressed if there's some tantric, it may be very powerful, he can put all the people in a village into some trance and put them under his control. People are very afraid of tantrics. Rightly so, they're very powerful. They get power from evil spirits. You know, the tantrics are the, the mighty demigods, like the sun. But we should know that all of these demigods, all of the power in the universe, springs from but a spark of Krishna's splendor. If we see a mighty storm, or uh, devotees uh, described to me once when I was in Los Angeles, that just at the end of the street where the the devotees live, where we have our temple on Watsika Avenue. Just at the end of the street, there'd be, there's a big gas pipeline going under the pavement, and some workers had, uh, they were digging under the pavement, and they'd broken the pipeline, they'd accidentally opened the pipeline, and I don't know, and they lit a cigarette or something, and there was huge, huge pillars of fire going all along the street. Everyone was completely, ah, they were very afraid in a peaceful, relaxed Californian coastal area, everything, eh, everything's nice, you know, all of a sudden there's this huge fire, but it's only going vertically, so it didn't burn down the whole quarter of the city. But people were just, ah, looking at the fire, just amazed to see what a big fire, huge fire. Similarly, we may see people go uh, hundreds of miles to see the Niagara Falls at the border of Canada and USA. I've never been there, but I've seen much smaller waterfalls. And you can become entranced just looking and hearing you can be, you can just get absorbed. It's just something amazing. Uh, but then we can consider all of this, however <coughs> amazing it may all be, however powerful it may all be, all of it put together, all the energy of the universe put together is just one tiny spark of Krishna's energy. So we can see life everywhere, although modern education and culture disconnects us from nature. Literally, by having us live in these uh, cities, and also conceptually, we don't see that there is life everywhere. Of course, if you're living in a house which is next to some rice fields, all the rice fields haven't yet been made into, haven't yet come under concrete, it's quite possible that a snake will crawl into your house, as happened in the house I'm staying in yesterday and the day before. Two different snakes. Living in Bangkok, which is, I lived there in the, on and off during the 1980s, uh, capital of Thailand, Kung Tape, city of the demigods. That's what they say. That's the name, official short name of the city. There's common things. Snakes come in the house. And especially when it rains, then it gets flooded and you have all snakes swimming around in the kitchen. The Thai people would catch them and eat them. But mostly in the big cities, we... we they don't, just like now, there's a move in the big cities in India. You're not allowed to keep cows in the city. The uh, Traditionally, that's required for every householder to keep some cows. But now in the big city, they don't want cows. They're a nuisance. No more cows. So they want to make us just uh, everything completely... Uh, 
modified by modern life. They're, they're, all the rivers, they're all canalized and dammed. And <coughs> and, uh, everyone in Tamil Nadu knows all about that. The Kaveri water doesn't reach Tamil Nadu. Kaveri is... You'll see a sign on the road when you're driving, going over a bridge, Kaveri River, but there's no river because the river stopped somewhere around Bangalore. <laughs> it's all been dammed up and there's no river anymore. Yamuna also, dry for some part, uh, already practically before she reaches Delhi. And then what you see in Delhi is all the... Uh, the Yamuna is not actually the Yamuna, it's all the industrial and waste and sewage. So be careful when you go for a bath in the Yamuna, in Vrindavan. It's not actually Yamuna water. And they think this is very good, this is progress, this is very nice. Of course, they got the result of making so many dams last year by uh, damming the Ganga so many times, and eventually the Supreme Court ordered that one ancient Kali temple had to be moved, one of the Shakti Pitams. How many are there? Fifty-six, something like that, throughout India. means they're going back, way, way back. It's, it's non-traceable when those holy places were established. So they, they moved, to, to make one dam, they moved this ancient temple, and the next day... The, Massive floods. So, they're messing, they don't know what they're messing around with. They're digging the oil out of the earth, hurting the earth, who is our mother. The cow is our mother, the earth is our mother. The earth is the wife of Vishnu. It's not just some Hindu mythology, it's a fact. So, by uh, mistreating the earth, then we invite trouble on ourselves. Of course, in Vedic culture there are also mines, otherwise how would there be gold and silver and copper? But there is a process for extracting these uh, ores from the earth. Even to cut a tree, one doesn't cut a tree unnecessarily but one has to worship that tree and uh, take permission, apologize in advance that this, this is required. We're cutting this tree. It's required because we have to make a temple of Vishnu. We require some wood or for whatever reason. Impious trees are cut for firewood. That's acceptable. But pious trees, there's a, there's a distinction. You can't just cut trees willy-nilly as you like. It's become a normal thing, just coming down this road to come to the temple. Here we see trees are cut. People just get a chainsaw and cut the tree. They don't think anything of it. It used to be a short time ago in India that that the uh, people and vata tree, that no one would cut. Even that they would block the street and break the house down, but no one would cut them. But nowadays they just cut They've become materialistic. They don't see that these trees are manifestations of Vishnu and Shiva. These are sacred trees. You can't just cut them as you like. But this this uh, materialistic outlook means that we don't see life. We don't see sanctity. Life means sanctity. Life mean, living being means part and parcel of Krishna especially the uh, higher demigods, they're worshipable by us. In Madhva Sampradaya especially, although they are very, very strong on the point that Krishna is supreme, they don't have any confusion in this matter, but they'll also worship various demigods, seeing them as part and parcel of Krishna. Theoretically, we could do it in the Gorya Sampradaya also, but there is some scope for that, but... Srila Prabhupada hasn't encouraged that and I don't encourage it either because the tendency is to get caught up in demigod worship without understanding the proper relationship. 
of the demigods to Krishna. And thus, for instance, someone will think, well, I have to do the worship of this demigod, the astrologer told me, so I can get rid from the, of this affliction. And then they get all mixed up in demigod worship. So better don't do it. Uh, better just stick to the worship of Krishna. But in the, yeah, in the Madhva Sampradaya, they may do that. Although, those who are Madhva Sampradaya, Brahmins, who's, who, who's, they're actually at home, they'll worship Vishnu, but they may be priests in the temple of Shiva. For instance, at Subramaniam, they, they, they worship the Madhva Brahmins, they worship Shiva. And in Udupi itself, there are the temples of uh, Ananteshra and, what's the other one, Chandresha? Chandramolishra. Of course, the, the whole atmosphere in Udupi is very strongly Vaishnava, and the Krishna temple is the center of everything. But they're just worshipping Shiva all day, every day. Mm. Well, if you're very strongly fixed in Siddhanta, you can see Shiva is a part of Krishna. But otherwise, one may tend to become attached to that demigod, seeing him or her as independently important, independently powerful. That's a danger for the demigods themselves that they start to think like that. <coughs> <coughs> so, in general, we don't encourage demigod worship. If, if we were to do so, to, we could do, theoretically we could do so, but there's no need to do so, because yata taror mulam nishechanena Chipyanti tat skandha bhujo pashakha prano paharaj cha yatindriyanam sarvahanam tataiva sarvahanam achyuteja. There's no need to worship all the demigods because if we worship Vishnu, it's, it's like worshipping the root, it's pouring water on the root of the tree, all the leaves, leaves twigs, branches, flowers and fruits, they're all nourished. So in the same way, if we worship Krishna, they're all the demigods are simultaneously propitiated because Krishna is all the demigods. They're all included within him, as we are also included within him. They are from our perspective, great personalities. Similarly, by feeding the stomach all the <coughs> limbs and organs of the body are nourished. So in the same way we should direct our worship to Krishna. Theoretically we could worship different demigods, but the, the people in general, we're supposed to be teaching others about worship of Krishna Surrender to Krishna, Savadhaman Paritya Ma Mekam Sharanam Raja, giving up all other varieties of religion, just surrender to Krishna. So people will tend to misunderstand that we're worshipping separate gods if we are to worship various demigods. It doesn't direct others toward Krishna where they need to go. Yadyad Achati Shreshtasta Dadeve Taro Janaha Janaha. Sayat pramanam kurute lokas tadanu vartate. If we take the position which we're supposed to do as spiritual leaders of society, we should act in a manner that is beneficial for others. So if you worship various demigods, then uh, people will think, oh, that's okay. And uh, they may not understand uh, why we're doing so or the consciousness in which we are doing so. Furthermore, the demigods themselves, if they're in the proper consciousness, they should be more happy that we're worshipping Krishna than if we're worshipping them. Because they themselves worship Krishna. Yang Brahma, Varunendra, Rudra, Maruta, Stunvanti, Devyaistavahi, all the different demigods, they worship Krishna. 
Yes, Janta Navidu Sura Sura Ganad Devaya Tasmai Namaha. Even the demigods and the, and the, the demons, none of them can come to the limit of his glory. There's no end to his glories. <clears throat> so, uh, Vedic culture, we do recognize various demigods and we should see them everywhere. Just like that. You don't, don't show your, don't warm your feet on the fire, don't spit into the fire, because that is a person. That's disrespectful. We shouldn't do that. Uh, Vayu, the air, described here as the, the most important demigod. This is uh, very much propagated within the Madhva Sampradaya, how Vayu is the most important of all the demigods, but still he's a demigod. All the different demigods entered the various parts of the Virata Purush, as described in the Purusha Sukta and the Srimad Bhagavatam and elsewhere, but it's not until the Purush, Vishnu entered, that they could all operate. The, 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 all the different ingredients may be there, air, fire, water, ether, or earth, all these ingredients may be there, but without Krishna, nothing operates. So Krishna is Jivanam, ah, what is that? Jivanam, hmm? Sarva Bhutation. Krishna is the life of all living beings, including the demigods. So we should see demigods everywhere. Krishna consciousness means to see Krishna and his energies. So, in, if we're actually Krishna conscious, then we're actually conscious of various demigods also. Otherwise, we tend to think in, a, in the materialistic, so-called scientific way that, well, this is all chemicals and Krishna's somehow or other in control, but the somehow or other is that he, the de- different demigods, he, he oversees them. He oversees them and they work under his direction. Out of fear of him, the wind blows. Out of fear of him, the sun shines. Out of fear of him, fire burns. It's because of him. It's because of Krishna. So for a devotee seeing life in, in whenever there's energy, there is life. It's not lifeless. It's not just some energies which can be analyzed in a scientific, empiric method. It's of course, an analysis of energies is not, a lot of physics is not empiric at all. It's, it's uh, mathematical speculation. But behind it all is Krishna, seeing Krishna. That's uh, Arjuna here isn't calling, for, he's not going to make a campaign for demigod worship, but rather he's saying that yes, the de- we, we see the demigods everywhere, but they are in you, Krishna. They are parts and parcels of you. So consciousness that death is a person, fire is a person, air is a person, water, all, they're all personalities operating these and they're, they are simultaneously one with and different, just like the Yamuna, she is a river, she married Krishna, but married Krishna means she was, she, in, a, in a personal human form also, human-like we can say, Manushakriti. Uh. But she is simultaneously non-different from the river, which is another reason why we shouldn't pollute the Yamuna, uh, we shouldn't damn her. It's actually very uh, sinful. Of course, that is also described in Shastra that there may be some situations in which rivers can be damned. It's not that the, it's totally forbidden in Vedic culture, but under certain considerations, certain rules and regulations and certain rituals have to be followed. It's not that one can simply uh, exploit nature and think that you can just get away with it. That becomes very sinful. So, uh, in previous cultures, which they called primitive cultures, 
because these uh, materialistic, atheistic, so-called scientific people, they think they've got everything worked out with no need of any recourse to any spiritual nature. Uh, so in these primitive cultures, which actually in many ways were uh, much more advanced, uh, they didn't have slaughterhouses, and they wouldn't have slaughterhouses. Even animal killing was known in all societies all over the world, animal killing for eating, but in most societies there was some kind of ritual uh, to uh, for killing the animal. It, was, it wasn't that you just kill and eat, but there would be some uh, religious ritual to propitiate the spirit, and they wouldn't kill more than they needed, only what they need, and they were very careful not to, not to uh, uh, wipe out any species. They would, uh, just like even now, Hare <coughs> Krishna. What did I say? Even nowadays in uh, in rivers, at least I know from England, and I presume it's like that in much of the Western world, that uh, you're not allowed to go fishing in rivers at certain times of year. Hmm. Because that is the time when the fish are spawning. The, 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 the fish are spawning means they're all young fish. And if you, if you kill the fish at that time, then the whole, the, 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 the whole uh, population of fish will be wiped out. Do they have that in your country? I presume they have that also. You're not allowed to go fishing in the rivers at a certain time of year. So there's some consciousness of that, is there? <coughs> Even to the present day. <laughs> but uh, although we talk in, in Vedic culture we talk of Brahman as the one underlying principle of everything that understanding may be in a, in a less developed way less philosophical way than, than in Vedanta that's there all over the world or the idea that there's one underlying God uh, that was there previously in, in many cultures all over the world the, the underlying essence of everything so that is the impersonal Brahman and beyond that is Krishna beyond all personality is impersonality and beyond that is spiritual personality, mostly people think that they've reached the zenith of spiritualism if they come out of the concept of personality and come to that of impersonality but still in day to day life there people would, would respect various demigods, but they would see that beyond all the demigods, there is one ultimate principle. So that we accept also, but we accept that Brahmano hi pratishtaham, that the basis of the impersonal Brahman is Krishna himself. That, that impersonal Brahman is also Krishna, but that, that is not a full understanding of Krishna. Vedanti tat tatva vidas tatvam yaj jnana madvayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabhyate that one tatva param tatva supreme principle or entity is brahman paramatma and bhagavan advaya these are not these are not separate entities it's just that uh, the understanding is more complete if we understand that the supreme entity is impersonal Brahman, but also Paramatma and also Bhagavan, the supreme personality of Godhead. Mm. Everything in this world changes at every moment. That is the nature of nature. Everything changes. There are various philosophical speculations about this. If I point to a chair and say, this is a chair, the object that I indicated at the beginning of the sentence is no longer the same, 
by the time I reach the end of the sentence. And in fact, even by the time I'm looking at it, and even in the time it takes, it to, in modern scientific terms, for the light waves to reach the retina of my eye and get turned upside down again and right side up again and in the cortex of my brain that that uh, that uh, processes vision, I see the chair even between seeing and being conscious of seeing what I saw is no longer there because everything is changing yoga chiti iti jagat at the molecular level, we can say in modern science, that's always changing. Everything is always changing. So according to Buddhism, or prominent schools of Buddhism, nothing actually exists. We can't actually say that anything exists, because as soon as you imagine it to exist, then already whatever it was has changed. So this is a uh, philosophical problem. Therefore we get shunyavad, that all appearances, th there's no actual continuity in, every, in anything. Uh, of course, this poses very serious philosophical problems, uh, especially if you're hungry and you want to eat. Uh, if you philosophize that, well, I want to eat, but I don't really want to because... A second ago, what I was is not the same as what I am now, but still I want to eat something. Uh, uh, we have all these skeptics, well, I don't, we don't believe in anything, and you can't believe in anything, but then when they're hungry, they sure believe in food. They don't, the philosophy gets suspended at that point in time. When they have to go past stool, they, they think, well, I, I could also pass it in my dhoti, what difference does it make? Because it's all unreal anyway, but they generally don't do that. If they really wanted to be uh, skeptics, then they should be able to do that. But the, uh, the Vedic knowledge, Veda means knowledge, what is conceptualized in other cultures, that there, everything is alive, there's a spirit in everything that beyond all the spirit there is the one ultimate principle that is conceptualized in other cultures. But in the Vedas there is clear knowledge given of this. Uh, what is the, what is that? Well, he, he, to understand that Brahman may be not so clear knowledge because it is, Brahman is inscrutable. But the impersonal Brahman is uh, very difficult to understand. Difficult to understand means it's mostly understandable by negativity. Nati nati. It's not this, it's not that. That which is beyond. Parastasmatu bhavanyo vyakto vyaktat sanatana yasa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyatsu navinashati. That which continues to... Everything in this world is subject to destruction. That doesn't just mean that at the end of time, yes, there is an end of time, but then there's a beginning again after that. But at the end of time of the universe, everything in the universe is destroyed. But actually at every moment, destruction is going on. This is not just something which has been understood from studies at the microatomic level, but in Vedic culture also speaks of this. There is one kind of pralayam mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam and elsewhere. One kind of destruction is nitya pralaya. It means everything in this world is being destroyed at every moment. Nothing stays the same. The underlying principle that holds everything together. What is it that holds everything together? It is not gravity. What, what is it that maintains all... The scientists should ask this. What is it that maintains all the laws of the universe in perfect order? What is that? That is ultimately Krishna. Mani, the ma manifest the impersonalism as impersonal Brahman. But ultimately is life. that The supreme life that holds everything together. Otherwise, it's impossible to explain how this universe 
exists. And even if we bring in intelligent design, which some people are trying to do now, there's still no, they still don't understand why it exists. So we're still a step ahead of everyone else by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada. We've been given this Vedic knowledge. Mm. The, the, the stability of everything. Why everything goes on in an ordered way. That is because of Krishna. Various demigods assist him in that at the microcosmic level also. The, the, the atoms are moving. The, the eyes blink. Why is that? There are different demigods overseeing everything. So when Arjuna says to Krishna that you are Vayu, you are Yama, you are Agni, you are Varuna, and so on, it's not some theoretical understanding. He's seeing the, the, the Vishvarupa, the universal form of Krishna, directly. Um, and in Vedic culture, it's like that. Or in, in any uh, culture that is in, in contact with nature, we can see the spiritual everywhere. The problem with most of these cultures, just if, if we see what they call primitive cultures, they're in contact with nature and they understand that there, there is, nature is alive. There are various spirits and higher beings, but they don't understand, they don't have a full understanding. And they then, they think that we ourselves are part of nature. They identify with the body. Uh. <clears throat> so Bhagavad Gita knowledge begins with understanding the difference between spirit and matter. That we are not the body. We're only temporarily in this body. Although nature is something wonderful and awesome. If we uh, and we can feel if we uh, if we live in nature, we we grow food or we collect food or hunt for food, or, uh, and we take water from the river for washing and bathing, and we take fire from the forest for cooking, and we build houses out of the earth or the wood that we. we we automatically, we can feel our link with everything else in nature, but that can also be one, although it's uh, more wholesome, more psychically wholesome than the materialistic outlook of living in a city and uh, thinking that, well, I'm just here for a short time, then I die and everything is finished and I have to just live in this world with my polyester clothing and put it in the washing machine. Uh, this way of life which is completely cut off from any spiritual, un spiritual, not just understanding, but feeling. Even people go to temples, but they, they see the deity in the temple only. They don't appreciate the presence everywhere because they're, they're cut off from nature. So, People may be in contact with nature, but that's not enough. One has to know that beyond this nature is this, this supreme controller of nature, and that although it may feel very good to think of oneself as part of nature, one part of one uh, massive, a small part of one massive cosmic organism, in that sense, we're non-different from the trees, the air, the rivers, the wind, the sky, the sun. We're all part of the same thing. We may think like that. But a better understanding is to understand that actually we have nothing to do with this. We have nothing to do with city life and we have nothing to do with village life or forest life either. We don't belong to this world at all. Ah. Uh, we belong in the spiritual nature with Krishna, where in the spiritual world there's also <coughs> Vayu, there's the uh, gentle breezes are blowing. Yama, death is not there. He doesn't exist there, not in that form. Death is a symptom of the material world. Agni is there, fire is there. Uh, 
Water is there. Rivers are there. Ocean is there. Hmm. The moon is there. Everything is there. But the, what is perceived here as sun, wind, rain, wind, all these different things, they are reflections of the original of the original spiritual, they are counterparts of the original spiritual form of these uh, entities, or all within the spiritual world, all serving Krishna's pastimes. Hare Krishna. Uh, any question about this? Oh, I know a long time today. Making up for a few days' mess. Hmm. Yeah. <coughs> Krishna and his name, form, pastime, etc. Absolute. What do you understand by absolute? It's a word we often use. Independently powerful, independent, everything, absolute means everything is dependent on him and he is dependent on nothing. Yeah, then? Krishna and his name are non-different. If we chant the name of Krishna, that is Krishna. How do we understand that Vayu is non-different from the personality Vayu? Well, why not? It doesn't mean that they're absolute. That, that the personality Vayu is non-different from the substance Vayu doesn't mean that Vayu is absolutely powerful. It doesn't follow from that. It's not, I don't see there's a logical connection there. Hmm? Deities of demigods, yeah, they're non different from the, by the grace of Krishna. They can be present in various forms, in various places. But that's the point. The, the, that power comes from Krishna, that ability comes from Krishna. It's not an uncommon thing. It is. People can, someone sitting here can see something going on somewhere else. Yogis, they have this kind of ability. To us it seems spectacular, but Krishna allows, Krishna gives that facility. You can travel, yogi can travel through the Ganga or through the waters, that's uh, some kind of transference. They're, they're trying to do this, or they have some idea. But the yogis, Srila Prabhupada said, they, they'll go down in the water, in, in the morning, every morning they'll bathe in, in the four dhams, Badrinath, Dwaraka, Rameshwaram, and Puri. They'll do their bath three times in the water in Badrinath, then they'll go down and they'll come up in Dwaraka. Then they'll go th down three times. Third time they'll go down, they'll come up in Puri. Like that. They, they can do that. Prabhupada said, I've personally seen. What do you understand from that? <laughs> so to us this seems fantastic, but for, for people who are in tune with that, what we would call mystic abilities, mystic science, for them it's a normal thing. Krishna gives the ability. The ability to pick up this watch that's given by Krishna. We think it's very normal. Or for a yogi to, to go down in the Ganga in Haridwar and come up in Calcutta. It's a normal thing. For them it's normal. For an ant, if an ant saw us pick this up, you'd think that's something very amazing. Different people have different abilities. Madhu Kanta has the ability to catch flies. I can't do it. 
He can catch flies and put them out of the room. I can't do it. How did he get there? It must be a, a siddhi from a previous life. I don't think he... You didn't practice that, did you? Did you go to a course, three-year course, BSc on fly catching at your local university? I don't think so, but he has that ability. Some people, they just have the ability. They can cook. They, they go in the kitchen and then, in a short time, brilliant cook. Other people, all their life they're cooking and still they can't cook a chapati nicely. It's... So all abilities are coming from Krishna. He gives or he doesn't give. Tapami aham aham barsham nigrinami utsrijami cha. Krishna says that as the sunlight I, I heat and the rain I give it and withhold it. So like that. He gives abilities and he withholds it. And so some people he gives ability, to others he doesn't. Understanding also. To some he gives understanding and to others he doesn't. There may be someone who's brilliant and he can understand, he learned all the Vedas and brilliant and can quote them all, this, that, but he might not be spiritually advanced. He may even have what appear to be very deep realizations may not be very spiritually advanced actual love of Krishna can get stuck on the platform of exhibiting his knowledge and be satisfied on that petty platform <coughs> yeah. anything else? sure Yeah, so just one other point about seeing spirit in matter. I, I, I was reading yesterday about Arjuna. It's one of my favorite pastimes from Mahabharata, in which Krishna is not directly involved as the eunuch Brihannala taking his weapons from the tree in the crematorium. And then uh, Gandiva's there, but then he, he called all the weapons to be personally present. So it's not only natural phenomena, but even man-made phenomena may have some spirit there. The Gand just like Krishna, he has all his weapons. Their person, Sudarshan, is the most famous. The uh, Arvas of and known in the Ramanuj Sampradaya. Most of them are uh, what do we call that? This uh, possessions of the Lord, accoutrements of the Lord. His sword. Uh, what else? his garland, his club. So these are all persons and the weapons of Arjuna, he, he called them by mantra to come and be present. So one reason is his Gandhiva is very powerful, his person. Was it made at some time? Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe the, 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 that same Gandhiva, we don't see it in the world now. What happened when Arjuna left? Did he take it with him? Uh, that's uh, that as a living being. Similarly, this temple, I, I I feel that these stones are coming from the quarry, and they're stones out of a quarry, out of, out of or not even, not even a quarry. They're just they're big stones, granite stones here, and they're not formed into a temple yet. But we can already feel the the, the vibrancy of them, isn't it? Do you feel that? The, 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 the temple is coming. This is, this is spirit. It's already spiritual. It's not material. So everything is, is spiritual. In the spiritual world, the, the, everything, Krishna's flute, his cloth, everything. And 
In this world also, there may be a manicured garden which is made by humans, but but there's a certain spirit of it. We, there's a feeling of it that that feel, we can say this garden has a certain character. In English, we'd say that it has that because some being has come and is overseeing that. So that's another thought. There are also all kinds of bad spirits. <laughs> Are very common in Kali Yoga. Okay, finished. Hare Krishna. <coughs> the uh, Ayapa Kirtan stopped. How is that? Any idea? <laughs> is it? Oh, I see. Still the sound of stone cutting is going on, which is not very pleasant. But what to do? It, the temple has to be built. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Sri Sri Garnitai ki jai. Samaveta Bhaktavinda Kijai Hare Krishna.